You may be seated. If you, if you would, open up your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 4. And that would be page 1212 in the Blue Bible if you're using that one. It's 1 John chapter 4. We're going to be looking at the first six verses today. Out of this message, test time all the time. Sounds bad, but wait, it's actually good. Like test, oh no. I want to be taking tests all the time. <clears throat> test time all the time. First John 4, 1 through 6. People of God are the holy, inspired, and errant, infallible, authoritative word of God. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children... You are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his much needed help. Lord, please help me to preach your word with power. Fill me with your Holy Spirit to do so. Speak truth through me. Clarity, Lord. Open up my heart. Open up their hearts. Drive your word into our hearts as only you can. Show us what you want us to see here today. Transform us. Give us strength. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was growing up, I hated school. I've said it before, I'll say it again. No offense to any teachers that might be here. I didn't like sitting for long periods in those little wooden desks, you know, especially with my size, right? Didn't fit so well. I didn't like all the crowded hallways in between as the bell rang, you get into the next class and claustrophobic, you know, bouncing into people on the way to the next class. I didn't like the bullying that happened to others and came my way back in middle school. I didn't like the food either. The lunch ladies were sweet, bless their hearts. But I didn't like the food as much for a picky, snotty little boy as myself. I didn't like the teachers who, some of them scared me. Some were great, but some teachers scared me where they would say things like, sit down, shut up, or get out. Me and my wife still talk about that to this day and get a good laugh about that one. <clears throat> but what was perhaps the most traumatic thing in school for me, what, what scared me the most were the tests. Oh, those tests, you know those tests. And what were the tests designed to do? They were designed to find me out. To find if I had been listening or not. To find if I had been studying the material or not. To find if I'd been digesting that information they were tossing to me or not. And what was the worst was the what? The or not. Because I hadn't been studying. I hadn't been digesting the information. I'd been lacking and slacking as a student. And it, those tests found me out. Those tests. In today's passage, John isn't focusing on us taking the tests as much. But on us giving the tests. And I like the sounds of that, which is why I said, hang in there. It's good news. And this, it's not just a couple times a semester or every couple weeks, but we're to test everything all the time. And these tests will show and bring things to the surface in our lives. What we need to see. These tests are the tests that show all the information in our lives, whether it's even true or not. And because of that, these tests we're to give are the most important tests in the world. 
some questions we're going to ask and answer today. Or are we testing things as we should in our lives? How do we test those things? And who are we listening to? To break that down more simply for those of you writing this down, test, confess, and listen. That's how we're going to break the passage down. Test, confess, and listen. And we're going to start where I believe the passage starts there in verse 1 with tests. Look there in verse 1 with me. It says this, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So far in 1 John, John has been testing us. He's been giving the Christian, the professing Christian, tests to see whether there's evidence of salvation in your life. If you go back to chapter 1, John was saying, do you walk in the light or do you walk in the darkness as an overall style of your life? Then as we got to chapter 2, what did he say? Do you love the world or do you love God? As we got to chapter 3, he said, do you love the brethren, the sisters, the brothers, people of faith in the Lord Jesus? And do you meet tangible needs in their lives? test that he's been giving us to see whether there's evidence that we've truly been saved. Not the means to be saved, but once God saves you through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, you'll see these evidence start to come out in your life. God changes us from the inside and it comes out. At least it should in our lives. But today's passage is different. We're not the student test takers today. We're to be the student test givers today. And like I said, I like the sound of that. And we can see this test coming to the surface in the very first verse. I'll read it again. It says this, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. John likely has in mind here those people that we saw in chapter 2 and that he's been referencing all throughout the letter. In the context of 1 John, the people that were Christians, at least they said they were, but they left Christianity. They didn't just go to another church down the road. They left the faith altogether. And they were coming back, attacking the church, saying things like, you know what? Jesus isn't the Messiah. Jesus isn't the eternal God. Sin in your life, it doesn't matter. Live like hell. <clears throat> doesn't matter. And in this case, it seems they were also not only falsely teaching things, but falsely prophesying things. God told me Jesus wasn't the Messiah. Oh, I got new revelation, new teaching here to where God said he's not the eternal son of God. I see that there at the last half of verse 1. It says, for many false prophets have gone out into the world, showing us kind of who he had in mind here. And John says, not every spirit is from God. There are plenty of people in this world saying, I'm from God. Listen to what I have to say. They're everywhere, right? How do you know who is and who isn't? Are they all from God? John says, no, they're not. We often just look as, at people as people, right? We see people do things and we say, that's just the way they are. We say, it's just the way they were brought up. And, and that stuff affects Absolutely. I'm not saying it doesn't. But we just look at all of life and explain it in the physical. Well, that, that can be explained by this or that over here with what we can see. And John says it's not the case. There's more to it than just that. Paul brings that out in Ephesians 6 verse 12. Says this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. What we can see. He says we don't wrestle against that. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There are spiritual forces of evil at work in our lives and the lives around us. Behind the scenes. And we often don't see it. Or diagnose it as such. We don't even realize it. In this context, John's saying behind teaching, there can even be evil spiritual forces pushing teachings. And not all of these teachings are from God. In case you think, well, that was a problem they suffered back then. It's nice to look at this historically and that was great. We don't, <laughs> praise the Lord, we don't have that kind of thing today. <clears throat> Turn on your TV, right? 
Not all TV preachers are bad, but you'll find some on there that are. There are some good ones. But just so you don't think it's an isolated event, what did Jesus say in Matthew 7, 15? He said this, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Jesus also said in Matthew 24, 11, many false prophets will arise, many, many, and lead many astray. Peter even said in 2 Peter 2, 1, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. I could list others as well, but you get the point. What is the point? What am I trying to get across? What I'm trying to get across at this part in the message is not everyone who claims to be teaching from God, speaking from God, prophesying from God, teaching the word of God is from God. You can't just say they quote scripture and they say they're from God, so they must be from God. And because of that, we need to test everything. We need to test everybody. We need to be discerning people. We need to be less gullible. I remember years ago as I walked into a brother's home and and was talking to him, and there's nobody in here. Don't worry. Don't think, oh, is it so-and-so over there? Is he talking about me? (coughs) So if... It wasn't. But as I was talking to that brother who I love, who loves Christ, I, it was a TV preacher on there. And again, not every TV preacher is bad, but this one was T.D. Jakes. Maybe many of you probably have heard of him. And he was walking around dabbing his forehead with a sweat cloth. And, you know, if nothing else, he's very entertaining. I will give him that. And the brother says, he's really good, isn't he? And I just was sick on my stomach. And you know why? The problem there is T.D. Jakes, at least at the time of that, maybe he's changed his position by now. He didn't believe in the Trinity. He was what they call a modalist. That's declared as an ancient heresy. When you don't believe the Trinity, you can't even be saved. You don't even know God. It's that core to the Christian faith. He believed that the Father then became the Son and ceased to be the Father. Then the Son became the Holy Spirit and ceased to be the Son. He didn't believe in the Trinity. And yet my dear brother, who didn't know that aspect of his teaching, was sitting under his teaching in a very dangerous position. I remember Christians who I've talked to that love Joe Osteen, which, like I said, often is a punching bag of mine, which I apologize for <coughs> being so tough on him in a way. But they would say he's so encouraging, he's so uplifting, and I'll give him that, he is. That smile is encouraging. But the problem is on national television, when asked very pointedly, do you believe Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation? He said, I don't know. Millions of people lost were watching that for an answer. He says, oh, I don't know. When asked by Larry King, what about atheists? Are they going to heaven? He said, oh, I'll let God be the judge of that. I just can't say. <clears throat> Sad written books like have your best life now every day is a friday paul washer i think it was said if if your best life is now you're going to hell heaven is far better than what you're going through right now i assure you yet brothers and sisters who love the lord find themselves under these people's teaching in a very dangerous position one more that has duped christians for many years it's kenneth copeland He preached one time that Adam in the garden was God manifest in the flesh as much as Jesus Christ is. He said one time that he, Kenneth Copeland, is the I am as well as God. That's blasphemous. He said in March of 2020 when the virus, I don't get flagged on Facebook or YouTube, was raging. He prophesied. God said it was over and he eradicated it right there. When that didn't work and the virus continued to rage on, he came back and doubled down in April, did the same thing and falsely prophesied that it was gone. And it wasn't gone. He never repented. He never said, I I missed that one. I apologize. Nothing. He owns and flies multi-million dollar private jets to do ministry and says, I need those. Give me your money 
so I can buy these because to fly commercial with a bunch of other people would be like flying in a tube full of demons. <clears throat> I could go on, but I won't. I don't like to do this. I don't. But I feel it's necessary sometimes to protect the sheep from ravenous wolves. What shepherd is, are you if the wolves attack the sheep and you sit idly by, you take your staff and you beat those wolves out? There are false teachers. There are false prophets. We need to test them. We need to test everyone. We need to test me. We need to test everything I teach. My point is this, brothers and sisters, we need to test the spirits to see if they are from God. Not every pastor, not every teacher, not every prophet is from him. I'm not talking secondary doctors. I'm not talking if someone gets something different than you dis and you disagree with it, you got to mark them. I'm talking such egregious heretical doctrines as we're seeing here in 1 John. And some people are so far out there, <clears throat> as I've just named three of them, that they need to be marked and stayed away from called out by name. Those are three you need to stay away from. If you have their books, you need to burn them. If you have other DVDs or CDs, you need to throw them in the garbage unless you're using them to apologetically help others. <clears throat> but don't be sitting under their teaching. They're very dangerous. So we need to test people. We need to test what people say. But how? What do we test it up against? That's what I want to look at now as John addresses it in what I'm calling confess. Look there at verses 2 and 3 for me. Or uh, with me, I should say. <clears throat> By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So I'm going to try to get through this with my voice. <clears throat> if you haven't <laughs> figured out, I'm struggling a little bit. <clears throat> So bear with me. So John says we need to test, and we test it against what people confess about Jesus Christ, what they say about him, is what he says here. Now we've got to remember the context here. We can't just say if someone comes along and says Jesus came in the flesh, just believe everything they say that they're from God. It kind of looks like that on the surface, but you've got to remember context. Context in the Bible is always king. It matters. It influences the meaning dramatically. And what is the context? What is John speaking into in the letter of 1 John? Because think about it. Osteen and Copeland would say Jesus existed. Atheist historians will say Jesus came in the flesh. It's indisputable. There was a man named Jesus who lived... 2,000 years ago, a little over, and died on a cross outside Jerusalem. But the atheists won't say he was the Messiah, that he was the eternal son of God. <clears throat> so John can't be saying just that. So what is he saying? What has John been addressing up to this point? Think of 1 John 2, 22 through 23, where John said this. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. He links confessing Jesus Christ to what? <clears throat> he who denies Jesus is the Christ. He's talking about he who denies that Jesus is the Messiah. The Christ come to save sinners like you and me. If you go back to the beginning of 1 John, you can see there were actually people denying that he actually did come in the flesh. Most think this is Gnostic teaching, where the Gnostics thought that all physical, bodily was evil. So Jesus couldn't have come or he would have been evil. So, and that is a heresy. It throws out the incarnation. It throws out salvation. Big problems. And I want you to see at this point... This is serious stuff that John is addressing here, not secondary. <clears throat> People get this confused all the time. Okay? John is not talking about genuine Christians who disagree on baptism, on eschatology, on Calvinism versus Arminianism, on the gifts of the Spirit, these type of things, which are serious in a way. They're, they're important, I should say. But they're not to the serious level that John is addressing here. You hear people say, you know, so-and-so is a dispensationalist, like they're in a heretic. 
No, they're not. That's not what John is saying, unless you think there's multiple ways to heaven. There are degrees of error and mistakes. And what John is addressing here is a catastrophic error, a most serious error. That if you have it, you are outside of Christianity itself. You are, in effect, denying Jesus Christ himself. That's what John is speaking to in this passage. And he describes this kind of serious error in verse 2 and 3, where he says, Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. The test is what they say about Jesus. Now, why does he say it that way? Because if we look <clears throat> and dig into how, why he says it that way, it explains more. He says it because Jesus Christ is the center of Christianity. He's the center of everything. He's the focus. He's what it's all about, brothers and sisters. All of history focuses on him. We even count time by him, although they're trying to change that because they hate him. But what we believe about Jesus and then confess out of that is of the utmost importance to your soul. What does the Bible say about Jesus? Many things. Here's a few. Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Big stuff. Colossians 1, one more. 1, 15 through 18. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. It's all about Jesus Christ. <clears throat> He's the only way of salvation. All things were created through him and they're all for him. He's it. He's the focus. And therefore, what you believe about him and what you say and confess about him is of the utmost importance to your soul. We can see this today, literally, and knocking at our door, <clears throat> and those who come knocking at our door, literally, right? Talk to some Jehovah's Witnesses, ask them what they think about Jesus, right? They'll, you got to be careful because they'll say some tricky things. They'll talk about grace. They'll talk about mercy. They'll talk about God. They'll talk about heaven. They'll talk about Jesus. They, they kind of... <clears throat> Dress up the language to try to sound like Christianity. But when you get down in the nitty gritty, what do you confess about Jesus? He's a God, but not the God. He's not the eternal second member of the Trinity. And John says, what do they confess about Jesus, brothers and sisters? They confess that? Reject them. What about the Mormons? Often nice people, dressed well. But what do they believe about Jesus? The brother of Lucifer, right? Created being. What do they confess about Jesus? Reject it. Muslims even today have a mosque where the temple used to be in Jerusalem. And on the side of it is the inscription in Arabic, God has no son. <coughs> God's not the eternal son of God, they would say. Jesus isn't. What do they say about Jesus? They're not from God. And this all points to us how we test them even further. Look at verse 6. As we pull this out of the text. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. John the Apostle says that he, John the Apostle, and those teaching the same things with him are from God. And people that are of God listen to them. Think of the context. The people he was writing to didn't have nicely polished ESV preaching Bibles or 
all kinds of study Bibles. They didn't have the Christian book magazine that they always get me. They know when I haven't put an order in in a while, they'll send me those magazines. And there I am at dinner going, oh, circle that, circle that. A thousand dollars, I can't afford this. You know, study Bibles galore we have access to. We're so used to it and praise God for it. They didn't have it. They didn't have this. They had the Old Testament, if they, but there was no printing press. They might not even have had a copy of that, everybody. Maybe they had some New Testament letters that were circulating. Maybe they didn't have many of them at that time. It's hard to know exactly what they had, but they don't, didn't have what we have here. So John is basically saying, test what others are telling you, but by what we have told you. John the apostle and those with me. Test, another way to say it, test what others are saying by the amount of the word of God you have, <clears throat> is what he's saying. John wrote books of the Bible. Paul and others wrote books of the Bible. Test what people are saying by what we are telling you who ourselves write books of the Bible. And today we have contain, contained right here what they said, what they taught right here in the completed canon. Not only the Old Testament, praise God for that, but the New Testament too. The closed canon, the 66 books of the Bible. With 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all we need for life and godliness to test everything we have right here, what we need to give the test with. We test everything up against the scriptures. And if it contradict, contradicts this, goes against it, you reject it. It's plain and simple. John said Jesus came in the flesh. There were people telling that left Christianity saying Jesus didn't come in the flesh. John says reject it. John says Jesus is the Messiah. Come to save sinners like you and me. There were people saying he wasn't the Messiah. John said match it up against what we said and reject it. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When Joel Osteen on television says, I can't say if he's the way, the truth, and the life, and that he's the only way to salvation, reject it. And not just the teachings, but when they get that egregious and attack Christianity, the core of it itself, you reject those teachers as well. <coughs> Stay away from them unless you're going to witness to them. But the application for us goes further today, wider today. We can press this even further. Because John, and I think God doesn't want us just to test on the big things. Just maybe the doctrine of Christ or big heretical teachings. Test that against the, the word. He does want us to do that, but it, it goes further. We're to test everything. <clears throat> Look at what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 through 21, since he mentions prophecies in this text. Paul does here too. He says, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Paul says, someone comes to you saying, I got a word from the, from the Lord for you. I, I got a prophecy for you. They come. What's Paul say? He doesn't say ignore it, as many people will say today. He doesn't say that's cease, that's done, at the last apostle. That's not in the Bible either. He says, test them. Test them. We got people today that cast it all away, or they just accept everything. Test it all against the scripture. It's what the scripture tells us to do. Think about Acts 17 with the Bereans. What were they commended to do? Paul and Silas went to them teaching. And they're commended in verse 11 of Acts 17 for this. They receive the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Everything Paul was teaching them, they were receiving with eagerness. But what were they doing? <clears throat> they were testing with what the scriptures said that they had at the time. Even what Paul was saying. Because God will never contradict himself. So they were checking them. And show, so it should be today with people we hear. Right? Someone comes with, with a, a teaching from the word of God. The written word of God. They come with a prophecy, a dream, a vision. As, as Joel 2 and Acts 2 says will happen in the last days. They come with anything. What do you do? You test it all. Test it against the word of the Lord. 
And the idea here is we need to be ultimate listening, not to men, but to God. And when you test everything up against what God has said in his written word, you will in effect be listening to God. God speaks through men, <clears throat> but it, he will never contradict his word. And that's what we're going to look at lastly as we look to listen. Who are we listening to? Verses 4 and 6 with me. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore the world, or therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That's a piece of cake, right? Just comes out and explains it all. <clears throat> John's an interesting letter because you really have to dig into this <clears throat> to explain some of this. So John here is saying, he, he gives us the source, and we've looked at it some before, the source of our ability to overcome these heretical teachings that are coming at us. And what is the source? We overcome because of he who's in us is greater than he who's in the world. The evil one that's in them, in the world, attacking us. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Think of what John said in 1 John 2. 26 through 27, he said this, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. <clears throat> Isn't that what we're talking about here today as well? But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you, but his anointing teaches you about everything. Back there, we looked at the anointing he's talking about is the Holy Spirit living inside us at conversion the rest of our Lives And John says, it's the Holy Spirit inside you that protects you from falling away. God Almighty, the third member of the Trinity, lives in us, brothers and sisters. He's more powerful than anyone or anything. And praise God <clears throat> for him. Same type of thing in 1 John 2, 19 through 20, where John said this. They went out from us, meaning those who left Christianity, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. And you have all knowledge. There John saying those who left Christianity, them leaving the faith proves they never had the faith. Because you have the Holy Spirit. He says you are anointed. He contrasts it. They left and they were not of us. You are of us and are protected. And the Holy Spirit who lives inside us not only protects us from leaving the faith today, but he gives us discernment in who is from God and who is not. Now, I wish I could say that that means a Christian won't turn on T.D. Jakes on the television or watch some Joel Osteen. <clears throat> but it's not the case. True Christians do do that. But here's the thing, if a Muslim or a Mormon or one of those false teachers comes trying to say, guess what? Jesus is not the only way to salvation. Or the Trinity is a facade. Or some other orthodox, non-orthodox, heretical teaching, your spidey sense will go up. And it isn't your spidey sense. The Holy Spirit We'll send up the red flag. We'll sound the alarm. Wait a second. This doesn't feel right. This doesn't look right. Wait, this contradicts this? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <clears throat> but sadly, those false teachers often deceptively teach these things. They inch them in. They dress them up to kind of fool you. And John says the world listens to the world, but believers listen to those who are from God. I mean, just think here today, I'm preaching about Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, and he is. I'm saying all of everything is about him. He's the pinnacle of it all. But what's an unbeliever if they're in here or come in here today going to say, they're either going to get converted, I pray for that, or often they just won't listen. <clears throat> they're yawn, they'll get mad at me. They'll think he's just some bigoted, wacky, tall preacher with a frog in his throat. But the believers here, when I start talking about Christ in those ways, in this church, it's usually inwardly because we're afraid to show any emotion sometimes, but you're saying, amen, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
Amen. Jesus is what it's all about. Amen. 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 <laughs> right? Believers listen to those who are from God who are confessing Christ. And yet, as with many things in the scriptures, there's this tension. As his, uh, his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts higher than our thoughts. Our finite brains cannot fully comprehend all of his ways. And the tension is we are protected from God and yet be careful and watch out. We're protected from falling away and yet we are cautioned, don't fall away. We are told that we will listen to those from God and yet there's this Admonishment in here, built in, that says, only listen to those who are from God. That the tension there, that we're protected. And we should have comfort in that. And yet from that source, from that state of protection and comfort, fight the fight of faith. Stand firm in the faith. Stand up straight. Test everything. It's a tension, but we need to hold to both of them because they're true. Maybe you're in here today and you realize I've never truly listened to God. I've never confessed Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, God has a promise for you. Romans 10, 9 through 13 says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. You call on him and you will be saved. You turn from yourself and your sin to him, the Lord Jesus, and believe what he's done for you. You will be saved. Test. Confess and listen. How are you doing today with this, brothers and sisters? Have you been starting to be lured away a little bit? Maybe you've been given in to some false teachers. Maybe you didn't even realize that they were false teachers, how subtle they have been acting and tricking. <clears throat> Maybe you're realizing it now. How have you been doing? Have you been a little too gullible? And brothers and sisters, we need to be discerning. We need to be testing. We need to be gracious. We need to be merciful with people, but we need not be drawn away from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I leave you today with what John said in the first verse of our passage and the last verse, because I think it sums it up. Verse one, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. And lastly, he said, by this, we know the spirit of truth <coughs> and the spirit of error. As you leave today, make sure you take your tests with you to be giving out in your lives. And if you didn't bring your test with you, maybe you need to get it off the shelf and dust this thing off and get ready to start dishing these tests out. <clears throat> For God will work through his word and give us discernment. Let's pray. Lord, I pray you do just that. Lord, help us not be overly critical stay away from the secondary issues and, and just calling them heretics, Lord. But Lord, help us not give in to heretics too, Lord. Just give us discernment. Give us wisdom. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.